Our journey starts in Asmera, the capital of Eritrea, an African city with the relaxed and welcoming atmosphere of the Mediterranean. It's surprisingly like a city in southern Italy, with cafes and bars. Even in winter, it's warm enough for shirt sleeves, and overhead, there are the clear blue skies. Eritrea lies on the Red Sea coast between Sudan and Djibouti and is bordered by Ethiopia to the south. Asmera is a hundred kilometers from the coast and is perched on a steep escarpment over 2,000 meters above sea level. It dates from the 16th century when four villages united to protect themselves against bandits. Today, it's a city with a diversity of cultures, African, Islamic and Italian. From the turn of the century until the Second World War, Eritrea was an Italian colony. It was the first Italian governor who made Asmera the capital, and the Italians certainly left their mark on the city's architecture. The Roman Catholic Cathedral, for example, was built in the 1920s. And the streets are full of Italian cars from the 1960s. Leading off the main street are many good hotels and guest houses. This is a lived-in city where the mixture of schools, houses, offices and shops jostling side by side helps to make the visitor feel relaxed in a capital where crime is virtually unknown. It's the people who make Asmera what it is. Visitors are free to wander around, soaking up the sights and sounds as the Asmerans go about their daily lives. The markets around the city centre receive fresh fruit and vegetables every day. And there's fresh fish too, from the Red Sea. Tourists are still a novelty here. You can stroll around and enjoy the relaxed atmosphere without the hustle and bustle found in other African cities. The skills you see have been handed down for generations. There's always a smile for the customer. Asmera is famous for its silversmiths. Eritrea was once part of an important trade route for precious metals and is still known for its fine craftsmanship. These links with the outside world not only brought gold and silver, but also different cultures and religions. A prominent landmark is the Al Kulafe Al Rashidin Mosque. A huge crowd was leaving, one group breaking into an impromptu dance. <laughs> On a nearby hill is the Church of St. Mary's, a Coptic Christian church built in the early part of the century. 
The surrounding buildings are much older, a combination of Italian and Eritrean styles. During services, men sit on the left and the women on the right. On our visit, we just had the company of the murals which completely cover the interior walls. There's a mix of Europe and Africa here in the gardens of the National Museum. Hollyhocks flourish among palms and other exotic plants. This was once the state palace of Haile Selassie, the former ruler of Ethiopia. It's now the National Museum of Eritrea. With so little written about the country, a visit to the museum is a chance to discover some history firsthand. A war museum is planned for the gardens to commemorate Eritrea's 30 years of struggle to secure independence from Ethiopia. There are many reminders of the cost of this conflict the tank graveyard on the outskirts of the city. Asmera has many war cemeteries carefully maintained as a tribute to those who gave their lives. There have been positive relations between Eritreans and their Ethiopian neighbors. With determination, the Eritreans are rebuilding their country, and today the streets of Asmera are alive with hope. For the traveller, the call to prayer each day is as reliable as an early morning call. It's time for the road. You can tour the country by bus, but if you want to get off the beaten track, it's possible to hire a car or an off-road vehicle through one of Asmera's many tour operators. They can also arrange guides, scenic tours, transfer from the airport and hotel reservations. The Ministry of Tourism can also provide information. The first leg of our journey is through the southern highlands to Senafe, close to the Ethiopian border. The roads are good, the weather's hot, and the views are some of the most spectacular anywhere in the world. Few people live here now, but this landscape bears traces of earlier civilizations. It's an area rich in archaeological sites. Most have never been excavated. Few are even visited. To be here is to step back into the distant past. That was almost true at Kahaito. When this farmer added an extension to his house, he uncovered ruins from the Queen of Sheba's reign. To find these ancient sites, it's essential to have a good guide. We were led to a place where few people have ever been. Were these lions, antelope, buffalo? They're still to be properly identified. What sort of world was outside this artist's cave? What evidence lies within this tomb? Queen of Sheba's pool is a site of national significance. Its waters deep in legend. Further on is Keskase, thought to be a staging post on the route from the third century kingdom of Axum to the port of Adulis on the Red Sea coast. What stories lie within these gigantic blocks of stone? How did they get here? The answer might be in this inscription, written in the language of Sabaean, but it's never been accurately translated.
These ruins are all that's left of the cities of Matera and Belu Kalu, once home to several thousand people. What windows on their lives lie within these walls? Tunnel or tomb? Legend has it that the staircase was the entrance to an underground route to Axum. Without further research, all we have is our imagination to bring this landscape back to life. This obelisk on the Sanafe Road is also part of the incomplete historical jigsaw. The crescent symbol is of South Arabian origin. Was this part of the trade route to the east? The Sanafe oak tree is a living calendar. Only one of its 12 main branches flowers in each month of the year. Fruit on this branch, it must be February. A new spring day, and as the children of Sanafe make their journey to school, our travels take us north and west. We return to Asmera, and then on to the town of Keren. It's built on a plateau cradled by mountains, and its name means mountain. There's a gentle pace of life here, on our visit, we saw more camels than cars. It was the day of the wood market, attracting people from outlying villages. There are many different kinds of craftsmen here. There's a brisk trade in household goods, livestock, and provisions. Keren is another important centre for gold and silversmiths, and their workshops line the street close to the main market. But there's another kind of wealth to be found in this town. Keren has one of Eritrea's largest cattle and livestock markets. Within walking distance of the market is the shrine of St. Mariam Dirit, set in the heart of a baobab tree. Keren enjoys a special climate, and the surrounding area is highly cultivated with orange groves and fields of vegetables. The next part of our journey takes us to a very different landscape, the dry, arid region of the western lowlands. After a day's drive, we jolted into Baron II, with its one main street. There are many nomadic tribes in this area, and Baron II is in the heart of Kunama territory. It's believed that the Kunama people were among Eritrea's first inhabitants. Being a market town, Barantu attracts many people from the surrounding areas, and there's a colourful mix of tribal cultures. The dusty streets ripple with everyday life. With the heat here in the western plains, the pace of life is refreshingly slow, and marketing is a leisurely chat. Animals are treated well and have a similar status to cars in the Western world. And here's the equivalent of a Rolls Royce. It's grinding millet seed for oil, a process which hasn't changed in centuries. 
But during the 30-year struggle for independence, the camel played an essential role, moving supplies around the country. It's now been adopted as Eritrea's national emblem. One of the joys of traveling in Eritrea is that it's full of surprises. And here, the everyday swells into a special day. Wave after wave of celebration rolls into town. A local priest has just returned from being ordained in Rome. Tribal communities of every denomination join in the procession to welcome him home. The festivities flow on late into the night. We are back in Asmera, at the railway depot. The railway was built in the early years of this century by the Italians to link the capital with the port of Massawa. An engineering miracle, 115 kilometers of winding track. Having been abandoned during the war, it's now being slowly restored. The old engineers reawakening their skills and passing them on to younger men. The old locomotives face towards Masawa, but the tracks go no further than the yard. With no trains running, people have found other uses for the railway sleepers. They make ideal fencing. With the national plan to reinstate the railway, an amnesty has been declared, and the borrowed sleepers are being returned. Children who have never seen a train use the track bed through a tunnel as a shortcut to school. The route of the old line can be traced running parallel to the main Masawa road. Cutting a ledge around the mountain sides and dipping in and out of 59 tunnels. The next stage of our journey is also to Masawa. We've decided not to take the main road, but to go on the virtually forgotten old route, which descends over 2,500 meters through an area called the Appendice Orientale. We'd been told we would travel through three climates in two hours drive. The first, the dry weather of the Asmeran Plain, we'd grown to expect. The surprise came as we began our descent down the track of hairpin bends. These mountain slopes are continually bathed in damp clouds which roll in daily from the coastal plains. We zigzag down the steep escarpment into the swirling clouds. Other travelers appear and disappear again into the mist. Beneath the clouds, a sunbird feeds on nectar, thriving on the lush plant life that comes with damp weather. This area is a haven for wildlife, offering extensive cover and a plentiful water supply. Even the sighting of the odd leopard has been reported. 
The rainforest climate is ideal for coffee trees and they're being cultivated commercially on some of these slopes. This route was once used to bring salt from the coastal plains, but is so little used now that grass grows in the middle of the road. In the lower foothills, the rivers flow into an area of volcanic activity, and at Mai Wui, we find the bubbling hot springs of a sacred communal pool. There are plans to develop this area into a health spa. We are now in the third climatic region, the hot coastal plain. This is Masawa. Cooled by sea breezes, the town is built on two islands just off the coast. It's linked to the mainland by a causeway, which also takes the railway line. This is the first stretch of railway to be reopened, and a regular service runs from the mainland to the port. Masawa was once the largest and safest port on the east coast of Africa. The whitewashed buildings recall grander times when there were great balls at the Red Sea Hotel and the harbour was a base for genteel yachting. Masawa still has great charm and is destined to become a major resort for tourists. Architecturally, the city is an intriguing mix of Italian and Middle Eastern styles. Sadly, a lot of the buildings suffered damage before liberation. However, Eritreans are known for their pride and determination, and already a rejuvenated Masawa is growing from the old. These are the rebuilt government offices. The harbour welcomes visiting yachts, as well as being a base for traditional fishing dhows. This dhow operates as a water taxi. Before setting out to sea, fishermen load ice at the quayside. And visitors load provisions. At the Dalak Hotel, you can charter a boat and enjoy the luxury of cruising. This is an adventure made very easy. You can almost jump on board from the hotel's coffee lounge. We are now heading for the Dalak Archipelago. 350 islands just off the coast of Eritrea, renowned for the diving and bird life. After just two hours, our first landfall is Madot, a small deserted island dominated by its shell-white beaches. Land temperatures can reach up to 45 degrees in summer months and the Caribbean-like waters are as refreshing as a warm bath. The island of Dissé, like all the other islands, is under the protection of the Eritrean government. Permission to visit can be obtained from the tourist offices in Masawa. The waters around the Dalak Islands are one of the world's few undiscovered areas. A 
As a result of the lack of fishing in past years, there's an abundance of life to be found in the coral caves and crevices. There's safety in numbers, and glassfish take refuge in this coral maze. An angelfish confuses would-be predators with its color scheme, and tiny clownfish make their home in the stinging tentacles of a sea anemone. Camouflaged in the rocks, a large stingray rests. A giant grouper hovers on the outer reef, and below, a lionfish hunts for a meal. Divers are a rarity here, and our presence is investigated by a moray eel. Our next stop, 500 kilometers to the south, is Aseb, Eritrea's main port and a major route for imports into Ethiopia. We're at the southern end of the country and the closest we come to the border with Djibouti. Away from the noise of the quayside, Aseb has a thriving cafe life and a friendly air. The tree-lined streets are refreshed by sea breezes, making Aseb more temperate than the surrounding inland areas. The Church of St. Michael is next to a beach which is home to the local fishing fleet. The fishermen carry out their own repairs. Nearby, new boats are still being built in the traditional way. Fish isn't the only harvest of the Red Sea. It also provides Aseb with a major export, salt. With the help of some machinery, salt is still produced as it has been for thousands of years. Sea water filled pools are left to evaporate in the wind and sun. Dehydration is something we now have to guard against. For tomorrow morning, before sunrise, we must leave Aseb, heading north on a two-day drive of over 700 kilometers. Denkalia, a volcanic landscape which separates Aseb from the rest of Eritrea. This journey through wild, harsh terrain is one of the most magnificent you can take in Eritrea and very few people attempt it. As we set out for Masawa, one well-wisher bid us safe journey and added, be brave. The region is home to a number of nomadic tribes. They travel with their livestock from one water home to another. Rainfall is virtually non-existent. The water holes are not only a source of a precious commodity, they're also social meeting points. These people rarely see tourists, so it's important to respect their cultural traditions. You should always ask before taking photographs of them. All along the route are stone circles, the burial sites of individual nomadic families. We now head inland, following tracks and dried up riverbeds. We are not the only ones on the move. the halfway mark, we reach Tio just before nightfall. After the heat and dust, 
this breezy coastal village comes as a welcome relief. The beaches are deserted, apart from a few crabs. Tio is the biggest fishing village between Aseb and Masawa. It's built on a sandbank, and the streets of huts built of wood and bamboo come right down onto the beach. In the rainy season, Tio can be cut off for several weeks when the fine sand turns to mud. We forge onwards across the flat deserts. Our next destination is the ancient port of Adulis. The biggest natural barriers we meet on this journey are the vast stretches of desert which reach inland from the coast like clawing fingers, choking the landscape. There's no road, all you can do is look for the tracks of previous vehicles and hope they lead you safely across. We're now close to the Danakil Depression, one of the hottest places on Earth, where temperatures can reach in excess of 50 degrees centigrade. We see other life, but in this all-consuming silence of the desert, there's no communication. Our journey has yielded many surprises, and now we were about to see one of the miracles of the desert, rain. Plants here often have to wait years for water, and when it does come, they blossom into their short lives. Some creatures, though, are unmoved by all this beauty. To them, it's strictly utilitarian. Flamingos also take advantage of the wet conditions. Near the village of Irafala, we come across a hot lake, and nearby, sitting on top of the volcanic vents, people enjoy a natural steam bath. What better to do on a rainy day in Denkalia? As we approach Adulis, we pass a camel train heading inland towards Sanafe. Could this have been the original trade route from the coast to the upper regions of Eritrea and beyond into Ethiopia? It's hard to believe now, but this was once the thriving port of Adulis. Over the centuries, the sea has retreated some eight kilometers. Within these crumbling ruins, gold, silver, glass, and marble have been discovered. Proof of the existence of this seventh century city of temples, tombs, and palaces. Before we left Eritrea, we were honored with an invitation to a coffee ceremony. This ceremony is always carried out by the women. Once the roasted beans have been crushed, they are put into the coffee pot, which is brought to the boil on a charcoal fire. The aromas of coffee, popcorn, and incense fill the air. In Eritrea, coffee is a delicacy, and it's considered bad manners to leave before you've had three cups. As we share in the aromas and tastes, we're reminded of the richness of our unforgettable journey, and that old maxim, it's the people that make a country. The children of Aseb, the reclusive Rashaida tribe. 
the dancing crowds of Barantu. These are some of the people who've made Eritrea such an unforgettable experience. The travels we have shared are at an end, but why not see more for yourselves? Your journey is just waiting to begin.